I'm an interventional cardiologist, which means apart from evaluating patients and diagnosing their heart problems, I also get to do some cool minimally invasive procedures such as balloon angioplasty or stenting of heart arteries or fixing other arteries in the body such as the carotid arteries that supply the brain, opening up heart valves or closing holes inside the heart. This can already be somewhat complicated for many of you to understand. And that reminds me about a very pleasant 80-year-old patient that I had uh, that had undergone a stress test for chest pain. And uh, I was discussing the results of the stress test with her and mentioned to her that she had failed a stress test and that there was probably a blockage in one of her heart arteries and that we needed to do an angiogram and possibly do a balloon or a stent procedure, which I would explain to her. To this, at this point, she politely stopped me and said, Doc, I have never failed a test in my life. And are you telling me your balloon is going to help me pass that test? At this point, I realized I had a challenge, a big challenge even to explain to a patient a very simple procedure that we do or a test that we do, that how can I communicate well with this patient, give her some good information that she can then make a good decision, an informed decision that will help her get the treatment. But as a society, we also have another big problem, and that is heart disease. With all the advanced tools to diagnose and treat patients with heart disease, it still is the number one killer globally. There are more patients dying of heart disease than any other disease. It is expensive to treat patients. We spend over $200 billion a year in this country. It's spreading at epidemic proportions in developing countries, and it's affecting the younger patients, the younger people. There is increasing awareness for heart disease, and there's a true desire for people to learn about this common yet lethal disease. But the real understanding for most patients occurs when they first talk to their physicians or providers. Patients don't just go to their doctors to get a cure or treatment, but they're also hoping from the physicians to get good information They'll help them get better and improve their health and maintain good health. And I think it is this combination of good clinical skills, providing good information and clear information that becomes the basis for trust between the patient and the physician. And this is the trust that maintains the long-term relationship and is especially important when we're treating patients with chronic medical conditions such as heart disease, heart failure, neurological issues, diabetes, So when we look at how well we are doing communicating with patients, it may come as a surprise that patients forget about 80% of the discussion that you just had. Half of the patients, when they were asked to recall the discussions, get it wrong. Or 40% of patients don't even understand the nature of their operation that was explained by their physician. Almost two-thirds of patients don't even read or understand the informed consent. And I believe this is a culture of trust in our healthcare system. <clears throat> but this can come at a price. We've known that poor communication can affect the compliance, patient outcomes, reduce adherence, affect patient satisfaction and quality of care, but it's also expensive. With the readmissions, revisits, reduction in the productivity of physicians or professionals, and not to mention the liability risk of poor communication. To understand the problems and the reasons for poor communication and patient understanding, I think we have to look at different perspectives. From a physician's perspective, I can tell you, we just don't have the time sitting with patients, explaining to them, or educating them. We don't have simple tools that can help us save time but give patients better information. In one study, almost 50% of the time that we spend with patients is spent documenting for reimbursement for that visit on electronic medical records. 
The fee-for-service system in the United States also disincentivizes us to educate our patients. But as clinicians, we must also look at the patient side. Patients are nervous, they're frightened, they're scared, especially when they're ill. And they're confused. They need more time to sit with you to understand. The fear is exaggerated by a sort of a pre-visit with Dr. Google, where patients try to research or diagnose their health problems. There are other factors, cultural barriers, aging, illness, difficulty hearing, etc., that makes it difficult for patients to understand. And sometimes the information is way too complicated. When patients don't get clear information from their physicians, they will seek a second opinion. And again, usually from Dr. Google. And as you can imagine, navigating the internet, or hundreds of thousands of websites, to get an information can be confusing uh, for many patients. In fact, in one study, 50% of patients searched the internet for their about their condition right after their cardiologist visit. Another important factor or barrier for patient understanding is the type and timing of information. It is not uncommon for physicians to draw on a piece of paper or give a brochure or a pamphlet to a patient, but this information is textual. It's difficult to understand text and comprehend compared to a video or an image. The digital material that's often available in medical offices is difficult to navigate. It's often commercialized and distracting with advertising. When we don't give good information to the patients, we don't even oftentimes uh, give clear websites for patients to go and research. And patients can end up finding inaccurate or irrelevant information. Now everyone in this room, and most certainly everyone in this city, knows about the explosive growth of mobile technology um, form as a tool of communication, but also as a source of news, information, uh, entertainment. But we also use in healthcare for medical searches, uh, for fitness and sleep tracking, uh, as medication reminders, and so on. We've all used um, tools in healthcare, um, and it is difficult to adopt and implement any technology in healthcare. It is slow for adoption. We have all used our mobile phones to book a flight to another country, book a hotel room, or a restaurant in another city, much faster than making an appointment with your doctor. But in surveys, both healthcare professionals and patients hope are positive that mobile technology, mobile apps, and wearables and biometric devices will help improve the quality of care, but also their medical conditions. So how are we doing now? There are over 250,000 health apps available in the marketplace. Two thirds of those are focused around the consumer, not the patient. And these support maintaining healthy lifestyle, nutrition, diet, fitness tracking. The health apps that physicians or healthcare providers use are often tools that are for personal use, such as accessing medical information to make better decisions or to access medical records, but they are not used for direct patient care. And hence, less than 20% of healthcare providers even recommend mobile apps to their patients. Now, this many folks see, especially in the healthcare professional world, as a problem with consumer demand rather than a healthcare professional push for technology in healthcare. And there are barriers to adopting technology in healthcare on a daily, in a daily practice for direct patient care. And some of the barriers are, firstly, the heavy workload of patient care and documentation. We just don't have the time. 
tools are not designed to work with the physician's workflow. Less than 5% of those 250,000 apps are developed by independent practitioners or healthcare professionals. Most of those apps are developed by technologists or folks related to healthcare or interested in healthcare. There are regulatory barriers and privacy issues that makes it difficult or restrictive or burdensome to share information with patients. And finally, there's the issue of cost. Who's going to pay for this? What about paying for something that is convenient for a healthcare professional or a patient? Who should pay for that where it doesn't have any improved health outcomes? Should it be the patient paying for it? Should it be the physician paying for it? Should it be the payer paying for it? Should it be the industry paying for it? Or should it be advertisers paying for it? One such tool that is helping overcome these barriers is CardioVisual. Now, this may sound like a plug-in, but CardioVisual is a patient education app built by practicing cardiologists, both for healthcare professionals and patients. It is a comprehensive library of brief videos that describes all, pretty much all cardiovascular conditions, prevention, treatment devices that patients can access on their mobile devices. And it's easy to understand. The app was designed for physicians to save time, but getting better information to their patients and empowering patients with reliable, accurate, and unbiased information on their devices. But most importantly, the device helps take the communication from the patient and doctor to beyond the office using mobile technology. In summary, I would say that for successful implementation of technology to improve patient care, healthcare professionals must actively get involved in driving and guiding innovation, either by seeking or partnering with healthcare companies or technology companies or industry. Coming for these conferences where they can really see the impact of patient care and technology. But I also believe that technology must be developed to support healthcare professionals, help their patients improve care globally. In conclusion, in healthcare where technology adoption is slow, the reimbursement for technology is questionable and the regulative barriers are high, I would challenge companies to try to develop products and validate their products in clinical use to improve care, rather than aiming for sky-high valuations by targeting consumers who are healthier folks. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe I have time for some questions. Plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Let's hold on for the mic to be there. I think, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Hi. Um, oh, wow, well, that's loud. Um, I'm a heart transplant patient. I had a heart disease with my old heart, and my new heart has a heart condition. So you're preaching to the choir with your presentation. Um, but something that I bumped on that you mentioned was um, informed consent and how patients often have to sign um, procedural uh, contracts, essentially, saying that they're okay with the procedure. And something that I've run into is anytime I want to personalize it, like for example, I insist on having ultrasounds of my biopsies um, because I've had a complication in one before and I often write it on the form and sign it and that form immediately goes to an administrator. There's no reading of the form. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, specifically with your talking about the educational apps, you know, some of the e-learnings that I've been given as a patient are um, sort of one size fits all. And I'm wondering how you would empower providers to not only make sure their patients are fully informed of the procedure they're having, but also leave room for that customization. That's a great question. Um, what we want to try to do is have this tool available for physicians or healthcare providers give you the information when you're with them so that they can give you 
of video-based information that is selective for you. Now, if there isn't a video on it that doesn't work for you, it doesn't help you. So they could be there guiding you with the videos to help understand. And it could be the nurse, it could be the trainees, it could be the attending physician. But we also can then have you go home and sit through and digest that information. We all know it takes us at least five times or watching a video, and I think the marketing folks know that at least seven times the message has to be sent in for it to really soak in. So this is the way we can guide, give the providers a tool to help their patients at the time of the visit, give them the relevant information, but let them, the patients, go home, download the app, they can watch it, and eventually connect the two dots, or connect the two, to then have you sign an informed consent. Now it could be at the time before the procedure, but you get enough time to watch the few videos, or it could be afterwards, uh, when you, after your doctor's visit. Uh, so that's the idea of, of, of getting a tool to the providers. At this point, we just don't have anything. I'm sure you went through a major surgery and uh, you probably had a few pieces of paper. How um, did you go about getting FDA approval for something like this? Is it an onerous process? Uh, so, great question. I do not have FDA approval for this. Uh, because this is content that's curated by practicing cardiologists, and we've sourced it from multiple sources, including the NIH, including the FDA, including the CDC, but also industry, to give physicians the real-world experience of what does a really a rotoblader device look like. Uh, there are several animation companies that create videos, but the product video of a particular device company can only come from the device company. So we've partnered with industry, we've partnered with government companies, we are partnering with other organizations and patient groups to get us information that is relevant. So this isn't a marketing pro uh, platform. This is a way that physicians who on a daily practice globally can say this is consistent with our practice and we can hand it out to patients. So uh, we also don't collect patient information. It's a free app that's available and globally. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say, I'm glad to say the patient power, uh, we're in about 130 countries. Uh, outside the US it's really been driven by patients because physicians outside just don't have the time even talking to the patient. So, Patients have a library of video-based information. So it's global. Uh, so far, I've not needed to go to FDA, uh, but maybe I'll look forward to that day. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Thank you very much.